Grace is that divine enablement to respond to life, to respond to setback, to difficulties, to health issues, to finance issues, to relationship issues, to rejection, the same way that Jesus Christ did. That we would respond to people in their wounding words, to people who misunderstand us the same way that Jesus Christ did. That is grace. It's divine enablement. It is not something you can do. It is something you can fake. <laughs> it is something you can act. The Pharisees were great at doing all the right things. They loved the law, and they did all the right things. They just did it without any love. That was Jesus' beef. They, did, they loved the law. They did all the right things, but they didn't love people. They didn't have tender-hearted com compassion or kindness towards people. It was all, you broke a rule, smack you on the hand. He's like, do you know the Father? No, they did not, because the Father is loving, and he's kind, and he's good, and he's long-suffering, and he's patient, and he's a Father who's always redeeming, and he's always inviting us into that process. So what are the things that hinder grace? Oops, let's get this to turn. I'm going to have Alicia come up. Uh, she's one of my staff members. She actually was one of my first advanced ministry training students. I'll tell you about that a little bit tomorrow. Uh, I think she, that was before I was even the director at the center, so that's kind of interesting and good fun. And so she's going to help me with something, and I'm going to need your guys' help as well. So this is yours, and I'm going to have you use that, and I would like you to kind of look through it. That's going to be your job to look through that. So... <laughs> And so, girls, this is going to be the hardest part of the conference. I'm going to show you something, but you cannot say a word. <laughs> right? And for girls, I know that's hard. So here it is. Do not read it or say what it is or describe it. But can you read this? Yes. Can you see what color it is? Yes. Okay, everybody can read it. Everybody can see what color it is. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, Alicia, would you please read it? God. And what color is it? Brown. Is this brown? No. No. Sure? Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's such a simple... Thank you, Leash. Yep. And you can sit back down. So often, we are looking through the God through a filter of errors and lies. We are seeing God through this lens that is not God. We're seeing him. Yes, that is God. Whoops. <laughs> like something's wrong and I can't figure it out because I'm talking. <laughs> right? It's like, God? <laughs> okay, that, that is God. Oh, yeah, I know God. I know all about God. I know God. I know God. I know God. It's like, yeah, describe him. He's brown. No. I know God, I know God, I know God, I know God, I know God. Describe him. He's angry, he's mean, he's impatient. He doesn't have time for me. He doesn't help me out. He'll help me when I'm good. It's like, what are you looking at? You are not looking at God. And yet we, we can, yes, but that's God. No, that is not God. You are seeing him through a filter of lies and misunderstanding of who God is. So you can know God, and you can know that that word is God, and still not know God. Well, what keeps us from entering into God's presence with that confidence? Well, the first thing is um, we have not received forgiveness for all, all of our sins. Mm, right, what you said to me yesterday, I did not forget it. <laughs> I'm going to quote her because it was so good. She said, I believe my sins were forgiven, all the ones that were behind me. But the ones who were ahead of me, I had to be my own Jesus and fix that and, and, and get right with God over and over and over. And so consequently, she, there was never a day she didn't woke up and she was right with God. And so victory and healing and, and power and everything that God had, it was always up ahead. It was never today. Today, i got to make up for today's sins. Of course, healing and victory is always going to be so far ahead in that circumstance. When God said he forgave all your sins, 
when Jesus said, I'm going to forgive all your sins, when he said, it is finished, when he said that, I just want you to know that was 2,000 plus years ago, all your sins were in the future when he said that. All of them were in the future. <laughs> now, when I say all, what do y'all think? <laughs> Does it mean something different down here? <laughs> right. Do y'all think all? Do you think tomorrow's sins are part of all? Do you think next year's sins are part of all? Yes. Now, I'm not giving you permission to sin. You are born again. You are dead to the power of sin to say no to the practice of sin. But if you sin, you need to know that's not between you and your father. Run in and say, help. Don't grovel. Don't clean up your act before you go in or you're never going in. You were made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ, period. You go in based on that finished work and nothing else. But most of us don't do that because we think we're going to get in there. He's going to tell us every bad thing we ever did. And so we, we do the push-pull with God. And we really don't know it. And I didn't know I was doing all this stuff. And then when God showed me, I'm like, why didn't somebody tell me that? <laughs> Turns out it's not commonly taught. <laughs> In many ways, it's really not. Well, I just want you to know something, that the sin issue is settled. It is finished means it is finished. Amen. Right? Jesus says in the book of Hebrews that when he returns, it will be without reference to sin. Why? Because that's a settled issue. When you read about the heroes of faith in the uh, book of Hebrews, chapter 12, or it's 11, and it starts in 12, 11. There it is, okay. When you read about that, they don't listen to any of the sins. Why? Because God has removed their sins as far as east is from west. Why would that be recorded? He doesn't have a record of that. So we keep a record against ourselves or each other. God is not. Because if that record was there, you'd never go into his presence. You just wouldn't. It'd be too shameful. And God, in his loving kindness and his goodness and his mercy, he removed that out of the way. All right, the sin issue is settled, so stop trying to earn or deserve God's love. Just receive it as a gift. It's just a gift. Either love is a gift or it's a wage. And if you are trying to earn God's love, you will resent him. You won't even know it in your heart until the pressure's on. If you're trying to earn his love, you will resent him. If you're trying to earn his acceptance, you will secretly resent him. Because love and acceptance is either a gift or it is a wage. It's what's owed you. And if you somehow think that you're ex getting God's acceptance or his love based on your behavior, when something goes wrong, you will be mad at him because he did not take care of you. You deserved it. Yeah, that's spiritual pride. And we don't know, and that's what goes on in the inside of us, and we just don't know. They're all thinking like, oh gosh, that kind of hits a heart, or this or that. We're not here to condemn you. It is light that shines into the darkness that overcomes the darkness. When God shines the light in our heart, in our hearts, what it does is the darkness always gets rid of the darkness. That's the point. Loving kindness shines the light in our heart to get rid of the darkness because it is the darkness that's hurting us. You're not the problem. It's the lies. It's the misunderstanding. Next one, we see God as angry or disappointed or sad. I'm not going to raise, have you guys raise your hand, but it's commonly taught. Oh, you're making God so disappointed. <laughs> yeah, I had a, right, I didn't need to ask you to raise your hand. You're disappointing God. Your behavior is disappointing God. I'm going to say, okay, if that's really true and sin is disappointing God, is he up there weeping right now? Is he just a hot mess in the sky? Is his, is his emotional state really based on me? That does not make him very sovereign. My own parents did better than that. If I had a fit, they weren't having a fit. <laughs> right. <laughs> But see, when we say things like that, it's actually emotional manipulation to try to get somebody to do something good, maybe for their own benefit. But in the, but in the process, in the process, you accident, we accidentally communicate, God only loves you when you're good. 
and he's mad at you and you're not. I don't know how to tell you this. You have peace with God by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been justified by faith. You have peace with God, period. It is not based on you and your behavior. So go into his presence. Say, look, I'm a flipping hot mess today. Help! <laughs> okay? You like messy honest? Ah, I live there. Because <laughs> look at me. <laughs> Because I put on a nice shirt, don't be fooled. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is life a great adventure. It really is. The best adventure is when you get in light, doing life with Jesus. All right. Some of you will be saying, yeah, but you don't know about my big sin. How do you know? Maybe I did it too. You do not know the roads I traveled. And I'm here to tell you, I don't care what sin you brought into this room from the past. God does not have a record of it, and he is not mad about it. You know what he said to me about my worst sin? He said, it was a bad idea, kiddo. I was waiting for you to see that. I was waiting for you to see that. It didn't work. I just needed you to see that that wouldn't work. You didn't have ears to hear, but now that it's all falling apart, I'm not punishing you. I was waiting for you to see it so that I could reveal to you my tender kindness and my goodness and my mercy so I could show you there's only one way out. And it's through my son, Jesus Christ. And that is a gift. So please do not insult me by trying to be good enough for it. Just take it. Because I love you. That's all I got. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, this is how I fell in love with Jesus. I just went crazy nuts in love. It's head over heels. I was like, oh, I can serve this God forever. Just forever. You know, God's really just waiting for us to realize our wholesale neediness. He's not mad about it. He's not sad about it. He knows we're dust. He knows we're finite. He's waiting for us to figure it out. He's like, they'll learn. You can only touch the stove so many times before you realize that's hot. <laughs> right? And so if that's the image, sometimes it's the image of your father. Maybe it's the image of your mother. Maybe it's an image, some religious thing. You just kind of believed it that way. All I got to say is, watch the, wash the image of your father off from God's face. Wash the image of your father who was always disappointed to motivate you off God's face. God motivates through love not an angry face, not manipulation. He motivates through love because love is the most powerful motivator. Third thing, you believe you need to have it all together before God will bless you. And then God busted up laughing. <laughs> well, right? Do you know God has zero confidence in you? <laughs> Let me just help you out. This helped me out. God has zero confidence in you. God's confidence is in his son, in you, to will and work in you a desire to obey him. Right, that's it. His confidence is in his son, in you, to teach you that I said do not sin because it will hurt you. It's not hurting me. Right, we're like, oh, you're breaking his heart. It's not hurting me. It's hurting you. And love says no. Love says no. What a thing we have in Jesus. He has no confidence in us. His confidence is in his son who is in us, who will lead us into trusting him until we sink so deep down into our neediness that the only thing animating our life is the power of Jesus Christ. And willpower has been completely forfeited because it has been proved vain to us. And he knows the way that's going to happen is through our failures. He knows. He's like, this is how they're going to learn. And he's not mad about it. Oh, that's when I just said, oh, I love it. You know, the branch actually has zero to offer to the vine. <laughs> the only thing you can give back to the vine is your will, your choice to love him back and trust him. 
but the branch gives nothing to the vine. Therefore, the vine is not sad when the branch don't produce. <laughs> right? It's like, you couldn't, <laughs> dar. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. I knew that wouldn't work. You didn't know it wouldn't work. You didn't know that would work. Once upon a time, I learned that. He said, oh, my child. Oh, my child. Just come to me in simple faith. Why are you complicating this? Oh, my child, I'm not sad. I'm not mad. I've just been waiting here. I knew you'd be along. I knew you'd be along. I hope you start to see God this way if you don't already. Already. Well, you believe the third one, uh, whoops, the fourth one. Religion has taught us false humility. We need to grovel. We need that false piety. We believe we're not worthy. Maybe you've been taught you're a worm. No, you are a butterfly, <laughs> born again, <laughs> right? Maybe you've been taught you were a sinner. Well, you certainly were born a sinner. Well, once you're born again, you got a brand new name. You were called a child of God. As the man thinketh, so he is. So if somebody tells you you're a sinner, say, no, I am a saint who has sins on occasion. Because if you tell yourself a sinner, the most natural thing for you to do is sin. That's the most natural thing for an unborn again person to do. They're born dead in their sin. They're called sinners. You are a saint. You're a child of God. You're holy. You're the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're seated in heavenly places. You're accepted in the beloved. That's who you are. And sometimes you do sin. But religious activity has taught us this. Religion has taught us if we fast more, if we pray more, if we serve more, if we be more spiritual, if we learn more. <sighs> you know what? That's a bunch of religious rubbish. I'm going to call it what it is. Please do not hear I didn't say pray or memorize your verses because trust me, I have. <laughs> and I do. And I love the word of God. But I don't love it to get something from God. I love it because God has already given me everything. Amen. I don't love it to get his approval. I already know I have his approval because I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and it is not based on me. And that is what gives me the confidence to go into the presence of God limping, hurting, feeling like a failure, feeling like it's going to fall apart, feeling like I don't know where all this is going to help, come together and how this could all work and who's going to hold this up and the whole world feels like it's going to spin out of control and I can't stop it and bad can happen to me and I can't make it go away. Instead of trying harder, I'm like, forget all that. I don't have time for it. I just go into his, into his presence. And you know, I hope you don't think of some spiritual humana, humana, humana thing. You know, I have those kind of moments. I really do. <laughs> but a lot of times, it's just a quiet moment. It's just a quick reboot. It's like, Father God, I just need you to cleanse my mind of unrighteousness. I just need you to stir my heart. Would you just cause me to see this from your perspective? If I can see it the way you do, Father God, I'll be fine. Now he just does it. He does. I might be walking down the road three days later, and there it is. I might be walking down the minute, road three minutes later, and there it is. And all of a sudden, I see it afresh, and I see it new. Why? Because I didn't try to figure it out. I said, you tell me. You be God. I'll be the receiver. What a thing we have in God. Oh, my goodness. It's rubbish. Okay? So the religious activity can become a substitute for trusting God. We trust in religious activity. That tripped me up for so many years. We do the Christian things because we love God, not to get something from God. Amen. They should contribute to our peace. They should not be our source of peace. Right. Amen. They will contribute to your victory because God will work through those, things, through those things, but they're not your victory. So many of us, when we think about that religious mindset of earning, we kind of view God like a, a <coughs> debit card where you got to put the money and the good behavior on and the Christian service and the tithing. you got to put it all on the card, and then you can have peace and you can have joy and you can have presence and you can get that good stuff. I'm like, what? <laughs> you have been, past tense, blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. You can't get more blessed than you are. Ha-ha. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> you can't get more blessed. You can't get more of Jesus. He's in you. 
You can only experience more of him when you forfeit living from your ability, your willpower, your trying, and just sink down and deep into neediness and just say, Father God, show me what I need to know. Show me what you would have me do. Show me from your perspective. Show me them from your perspective. Give me the grace to forgive the unforgivable. That's hard. Give me the grace to walk in integrity in a situation where I want to take a shortcut. Lord, I'm going to need strength from above. Because I can't muster it up. If I try, I can do it for so long. Then I'm mad. Right? I'll be mad because that's how I roll. I don't, I don't roll with tears very often. If I do, you should get out of the way. It's going to be super sloppy. Last one. Experience has taught us lies that we are not loved, that we're not accepted or approved, that we're not valued or have worth, that our identity is what we do or our ministry role or our mother role or my super job and my degrees. We don't believe that we're secure. Lies have taught us life and lies have taught us that I'm not safe. You know, in some places you're not safe with people, but you are always safe with God and you can recover there. Life has taught us um, lies that we're not able and we're not adequate. Paul said, not that I am adequate in and of myself. I bring nothing to the table. My adequacy comes from God. Not that I'm adequate in and of myself. Not my willpower, not my strength, not my degrees, not my pedigree. No. My adequacy comes from God. But we think, I can't, I can't. I'll never be able to. I don't know how to. Nobody ever taught me. I didn't go to school. I didn't go to church. And so then that lie keeps us from going into the presence of God because we don't feel worthy. I just want to say to you, those are very powerful things to not feel heard or understood or belong. I'm sorry for whatever happened to you. Many people will say to me, Therese, why are you in ministry? And I always think about it and think about it and I always come up with the same answer. Because it hurts to hurt. And Jesus changed that for me. And I just want you to have that because it wasn't hard. His his commands, his ways, they're really not burdensome. Sin was burdensome. Willpower was burdensome. But Jesus, he's a delight. That's why. That's it, in a nutshell. It's like it hurts to hurt. I did that for a long time. I just don't want you folks to hurt anymore. And these are the things that get in the way. Well, um, Romans 5, 8, and 9, we have them up here on the board. Thank you very much, Pastor Chris. Uh, All those lies have taught us that. And I really think God demonstrated his own love for us. I think this verse here speaks to all those lies. We could kind of fill in the blank here. God demonstrated his own love for us in in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the anger of God through Christ. You're saved from his wrath. You're saved from his anger. Your knees. God demonstrated his love for Teresa. That when Teresa was a sinner doing the worst things she ever did do or will do, God sent his son. God demonstrated how much he accepted and approved of Teresa, that when Teresa was a sinner doing the worst thing that she ever did in the past or ever did in the future, God sent his own son to die for her. How much value? You just keep putting that in there. Identity. God demonstrated that Teresa had an identity. She is called a daughter. She is called a child of God. And God demonstrated it. He proved it. He proved her identity by dying on that cross for her. I want you to put your name in there. Did you see how I put my name in there? God has demonstrated his love for, put your name in there. He's demonstrated that he accepted me. He just demonstrated that I'm a delight to him. He demonstrated that I am significant. He demonstrated that I have value. He demonstrated that he cherished me. He demonstrated that he heard my cry. He demonstrated to me that he understood me in my neediness. He demonstrated it to me. He demonstrated to me that I belong to him. And he did it on the cross. 
I have met your needs. Nothing out there will ever meet your needs. It will leave you dry every single time. I have demonstrated. I have already proved to you. Just believe me. Don't trust your feelings. I don't know what they're doing. Every 28 days, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I do not trust your feelings, ladies. <laughs> Men, try to wake yours up. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just teasing them. <laughs> just teasing, boys. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start wrapping this up. Where's that clock? Ooh. Yeah, let's wrap this up here. You know, half of us have received God's forgiveness, but we have not received his love. Some of us in this room, it's like, I have really believed in God's complete forgiveness. I have, but you didn't receive his love because you thought you didn't deserve it. Well, that's the whole point. Nobody did. This is not a deserve. This is not an earn. It's a gift. It's a gift. So some of you just need to receive that love. Just receive it as a gift. The other half believe they will lose that love every other day. Sorry. They are going to lose God's love every other day. Because of their sins, they're going to lose his, even their salvation sometimes. So they spend half of their time trying to receive forgiveness for sins over and over and over instead of remaining in God's love. I am unloved, got to get right with God. I am loved, I got to get right with God. I mean, they're just doing this. I'm like, they're never remaining in God's love. They're like jumping in and out of the womb. They never remain in God's love. They never secure, they're never confident of God's goodness. They're not going to go into his presence. And if that's the only place, and it is, that there's healing, freedom, and victory, do you see? Catch 22, they're, they're caught out. They have to know how good and loving and safe and kind God is, that he is not going to show you everything. He's not going to rerun every bad thing you ever did. And one of my most depressing days of my whole entire life, oh, I wish I had time to tell you about it, but it was snot and tears. It was six months of straight up snot and tears and just straight up depression. And there was nothing for it. And I looked up and I saw where I was relying on my willpower. Oh, it was Christianized as all get out. <laughs> Remember I read those five books of the Bible and I did not quit. <laughs> and I looked up to God and I said, I did not know. When I saw my, I was trying to do the work of God through willpower. You know what he said to me on that day? I'll never forget it. Changed me forever. I said, I did not know. And he said, I know. I know. It's the kindest thing I ever heard in the most broken and des desperate time of my life. He said, I know. That's why I told you. Because I love you. And you were stuck in a trap. I know. I fell in love with God all over again that day. If you don't know that God is that tender and that kind and that long loving and that long-suffering and that gentle and that understanding, then you will always do this. And you won't, like me, you won't even know you were doing it because you were afraid to let him in because you were afraid. Maybe you were like me. I was afraid if I let him in. I was afraid I'd fall apart. I was afraid if I was honest about one sad thing that I would probably just curl up and die because I had a boatload of pain tucked away. Just a boatload. And I thought if I opened that door that I would get swept away in all that pain and I would never be able to overcome it and I'd never come back and I would be gone forever. And so I held on to everything I had through my own willpower and I just kept doing this. And at church, I was getting all the church awards. I was. That's just honest. That's messy. But God saved me from me. He saved me from my willpower. That's what I needed saving from. So that I could go into his presence. And in his presence, I started to see me different. I saw God different. I saw life different. I saw my husband different. I saw the journey different. I saw all the people different. I saw ministry different. I started interacting with it differently. Not because I was trying. Because I couldn't help 
but share the same love that God had showed me in those encounters with him with other people, that same compassion, that same tender kindness, that same understanding. It just rolled out of me. I was like, who is this woman? <laughs> no, kind of really. <laughs> you guys always see the pretty side of these speakers, so just trust me, we're people. <laughs> no, I'm a, ten I'm a very intense personality. And because I was, it was harsh and hard and demanding. And I was like, who is this girl that you have made me become? Thank you, Father God. You are faithful. The work that you have begun in me, you have completed. Well, let's move this out. I'm going to kind of close this up with this thought of it's uh, Ephesians 3.20. And the verses that, um, uh, I better read it. Hold on. I paraphrase these things so much that by the time I get to it, I've only got four of the real words in it. <laughs> like, so we'll try to get her right here today since they're filming me and all. <laughs> all right, here we go, Ephesians 4, 20. Now for to him, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think according to the power of Christ who lives in us and works in us. And so that verse, we tag that on. I do it all the time. I still do it even though I'm going to know what I'm going to say to y'all. But God is, you know, he's going to bless us abundantly beyond all we can think or imagine. He's going to bless us abundantly. All. And we're attributing it to everything like cars and homes and, you know, good deals at the local mall. <laughs> he's going to bless us. We do that. But the only way for you to really understand this verse is to understand it's the last sentence of a prayer. And if you want to know what he wants to do more abundantly, so much so that this is a prayer that Paul put in there, you have to look at the rest of the prayer. Now God is going to do all those things because he's such an abundant and overachiever. <laughs> That's what I was going to call God. I don't know if you could call that. <laughs> I meant overflowing, but overachiever went in my head. <laughs> He's this overflowing God. Yes, those other things, that's true. That's going to come. Yes. But what you need to see is the prayer. And here it is, and we're going to actually close with this prayer and invite you up. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derive its name, that he would grant to you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, not willpower. So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, not striving, not keeping the right rules or doing the right things. And that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend that spiritual revelation, an insight from the Father, a mystery of his goodness, that you would be able to comprehend that with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. That whole prayer about abundance, it's not stuff. He said, I want you to be abundantly more than you think or imagine, crazy, nuts, in love with me. Because if, when you are, you will come into my presence with confidence and you will find that I am your all in all. That I am the answer to every shortcoming, lack, disappointment, rejection, offense, setback, and difficulty. I'm him. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think according to the power that works within us. God did not create us to need love. Isn't that interesting? 
He created us to be full of his love so we could give it away. We're trying to get love from people. We're trying to get acceptance from people. We're trying to get worth and value from people or people's opinions or our jobs. He didn't create us for that. He created us to be filled with his love and his value so that we go and give it away. Yeah. That he would meet that need. Now today I want to give you an opportunity to interact with this truth. Because faith is an action. It's not believing more. If you were Jewish, you would know faith is an action. Abraham believed and he left. He acted on that belief. And so I want to give you an opportunity to come up here to receive that love as a gift. To whatever lie, I named five different lies, whatever they are. If you, if you fell into those traps like I fell into that trap, I want you to just either in a minute we're going to have to stand up. Stand up in your seat or come up here. And maybe you do need to weep and wail. By all means, do. Some of you might just need to stand up to say, today is the day I am saying that I don't believe that anymore. I believe that God is love and he accepts me and he approves of me based on the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe that I have value and I worth. I believe that he's my ability. I believe that he understands why I do the silly things I do. And that he's tender, kind, and compassionate. And he's long-suffering and he's good towards me. And he's not mad at me. And so some of you just need to come up here and just take that step of faith and just say, today, I'm standing on this belief. Your feelings may not feel it. Please, don't listen to your feelings. They're not facts. This. Stand on this. Move up here because of this. Move past your feelings. This is the fact. This is who you are. Agree with it whether you feel like it or not. And so I'm going to invite you to possibly stand in your seat. Do something that is an act of faith. Listen to the Holy Spirit. It might be different for all of us. For some of us, maybe we never raised our hand in a church. Maybe that's that for you. I don't know what it is. But whatever that is, maybe it's just bowing down. If that's what it is, whatever your act of faith is, be like Samuel. He didn't even care. He's like, I'm just going to be in the presence of God on the floor by the altar. I don't care what it looks like. You know, in the garden when God saw you, or when he created Adam, he created everybody that day. When God created Adam, he created everybody that day, and he saw you, and that's when he fell in love with you. And he wants you to stand up, and he wants you to come up, and he wants you to say, I believe that. I choose to believe that. He wants you to say, you're the one who left the, the 99 for the one, and I'm standing up on the, on the one. Some of you need to come up here because you're the one, and you need to say, I'm the one, and I'm here to receive his love tonight. I'm going to pray a brief prayer in a minute. I'm going to leave this as my last statement to y'all. Humility. Humility is agreeing with God on what he said about you. Humility is agreeing with God's estimation of you. Humility is saying, if you said I am loved, I am loved. Knowledge and feelings exalt themselves above that. That's pride. Humility says, I am needy. Humility says, what God says about me is true. And the cross has demonstrated that I have worth and I have power of the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? That's what true humility is. Do you know what humility is? Humility is that thing that causes us to sink down deep in our neediness and just say, Lord, I actually bring nothing to the table but your son. And so will you teach me to live from the life of your son? 
instead of willpower that's been failing me. That's humility. And God's just inviting you to come up, take some time with the Lord, and speak to him. I'm going to pray, and then you girls can do as the Lord leads you. Father, we just thank you. I thank you for your presence here this evening. For this sweet spirit has created this place where we're safe in your presence. We're safe to be honest. We're safe to be frail. We're safe to bring those sins that were so deeply hidden. And we thought they kept you, us from you. We thank you that your presence is here to swallow up all of our pain and all of our grief, all of our doubt. Lord, I thank you that we are your sheep and that we can hear your voice. And so I just invite you to speak to the women individually. And girls, just open your ears. Listen for that still, small voice. And Father, I just invite you to just talk to us individually. Minister to our hearts. Settle down our souls. <laughs>